When I gave a lecture here at the RSA three years ago, entitled Out of the Red into the Green, I did so in the confident knowledge that the environment, the value of natural resources, and the realities of climate change were all generally acknowledged, accepted, and endorsed as political imperatives across the spectrum of public discourse. They remain, of course, fundamentally important. Indeed, I would argue they are the most important of all the challenges we face in this generation or the next. But I fear their political salience has waned. And part of my purpose in being here tonight is to shout out as loudly as I can that the environment still matters, that green is as important as growth, and that the two do absolutely walk hand in hand. It should, of course, be axiomatic that the environment matters. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the way we produce our food, the natural resources that continue to be available to us, the waste we generate, the state of our land and landscape. None of these are optional extras. They are all essentials for life and for our quality of life. We ignore their needs at our peril. But in emphasizing the importance of these things for public policy making, there's something else too. We are, all of us, creatures of place. We have a profound attachment to the space of earth in which we live. Safeguarding the condition of that place, which is the portion of the world we share with our families and neighbors, is something that matters to huge numbers of people. Governments and policymakers have to acknowledge this and respect it. The drive for growth is, in our current straightened circumstances, uh, an equally high imperative. Even if we weren't living through a double-dip recession, we know that in a modern democracy, the way to tackle poverty and disadvantage is to secure steady growth. We also know that without growth, deficits won't reduce and unemployment and distress will continue. And we know also that it is those who are most economically disadvantaged who routinely experience the most degraded environments and the poorest sense of place. There are some in the green movement who argue that growth is an enemy of the environment and sustainable lifestyles, that we should rejoice in economic stagnation or decline because it forces us to recalibrate the way we live and what we aspire to, that husbanding existing resources and standards of living is better than striving for more or better that contentment comes from an acceptance of what and where we are, and that striving to grow economically brings inevitable environmental deterioration, overuse of natural capital, and mortgages the future too. I don't accept this. Of course I understand that not all growth of all kinds is sustainable. But the imperative we have, especially in these times, is to search for growth that truly is sustainable. It can be done, as I shall hope to show in a minute or two. And the starting point must be a firm belief that we can't abandon either green or growth. This task is made more challenging, of course, by the reality of climate change. It is unsustainable growth over decades that has brought concentrations of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere that are leading inexorably to a changing climate across the globe. It is now likely that we will face an average global temperature rise of at least two degrees in the course of this century. It may well be more, with devastating consequences for weather patterns, temperatures, sea levels, patterns of agriculture, floods, droughts, availability of water, and movements of populations. Here in England, we have just experienced the driest combination of two winter periods since 1922. 
we had the driest March for more than 50 years. But now, almost as if to mock us, we've just lived through the wettest April since records began. And yes, it's absurd. We have hosepipe bans around many parts of the country, and yet it's been bucketing with rain for days. There have been buses emblazoned with posters saying, we are in drought, splashing their way through huge standing pools of rainwater. I simply note in passing that the April rain we've had has been terrific for crops, for gardens, for recharging reservoirs and streams, and for fish. It hasn't yet, though, been enough to get right down to the groundwater reserves that we depend on in many parts of the country. There's an important message, though, that hasn't yet emerged from all of this, and that is that this sort of combination of extremes of weather following in such rapid succession is likely to become a more frequent occurrence in future years as climate change begins to have an effect. I can't say here and now that the rapid succession of drought and flood we've just experienced can be proved to represent an incipient impact of climate change any more than I could point to the highest ever concentration of rain falling in one place in England in a 24-hour period that fell on the Cumbrian Hills in November 2009 with such tragic consequences. But what I do know is that the science of climate change tells us that we will see patterns of extreme weather increasingly affecting us over the years to come. We are going to have to get more used to violent changes of weather, to periods when everything dries up and others when everything gets deluged. This is the world we're moving towards. We haven't been helped these last two years by the airtime accorded to the relatively small number of climate change skeptics. I cannot overemphasize the damage that has been done to public acceptance of the lessons of climate change by the furore over badly phrased emails at the University of East Anglia and inadequately checked references to Himalayan glaciers in the IPCC reports. These were seized on by skeptics, keen to sow doubt, seeds of doubt in the public's mind about the accuracy of climate science and some bits of the skepticism got through to some members of the public. I'm pleased to note that the government, indeed all main parties here in the UK, remain firmly committed to tackling climate change and its consequences. But we have to work hard to re-establish the case more broadly. I pause briefly to reflect on the disastrous politicization of the issue that has affected the Republican Party in the United States. Climate change skepticism has not only become de rigueur, they'd hate me using a French phrase, but it has become, rather strangely, an integral part of a right-wing small government ideology reversing in the process decades of conservatism that was all about conserving. Sarah Palin, for example, has claimed that man-made climate change has been disproved. Quite the opposite is, of course, the truth. Climate change is a fact of life. It is something we have to deal with. In many ways, I wish it weren't true and that we didn't have to deal with it, but we do and denying its existence won't remove the need for all of us, big government or small government ideologues, to find ways of coping with its existence. It isn't, though, just that climate change has been struggling a bit more than before to find public acknowledgement. It's that the environment as a whole has slipped down the political and public agenda. This is perhaps inevitable, as the focus everywhere is almost exclusively on economic crisis, on deficit reduction, and on the desperate need for growth. The environment's voice is far less powerful. As a taxi driver said to me the other day, surely 
we've got more important things to worry about at the moment than the future of the planet. <laughs> All is not lost, however. The political focus may have turned away for the time being, but the public's commitment to the environment as green space that allows humanity to breathe is as strong as ever. As the campaigners for public forests or for the protection afforded to the countryside by the planning system could attest. And the number of householders classing themselves as committed recyclers has risen from 45% in 2004 to 70% last year. 74% of adults polled last year by YouGov for the Sunday Times thought the government should use more solar energy. And even in the field of climate change, there are signs that concern is rising again, as the number of people thinking climate change is, quote, a very serious problem, unquote, rose from 43% in 2010 to 49% in 2011. Public opinion may be more in tune with the green necessities of the future than many policymakers around the world might give it credit for. Whatever the public or political perception may be, however, the truth is that we, humanity, are posing ever increasing challenges to our environment and the environment is challenging us back. Our human connection with it is becoming increasingly, not diminishingly important. The impact of climate change, the needs of a growing population, the demand for food, energy and water the depletion of natural resources, and the creation of more and more waste. These are all placing greater demands on the natural world we live in and depend on. Around the world, there will be three billion more middle-class consumers by the year 2030, with lifestyles increasingly demanding on the environment. <clears throat> we have to know about these fragilities, we have to think carefully about how we address them, and we need always to remember that it's not just ourselves we need to solve these problems for, but future generations too. The world of business is already way ahead of us in recognizing this. I can put it no better than the opening words of a recent 2012 report by KPMG International entitled, Expect the Unexpected, Building Business Value in a Changing World. They say, and I quote, for 20 years or more, the world has recognized that the way we do business has serious impacts on the world around us. Now it is increasingly clear that the state of the world around us affects the way we do business. The resources on which business relies are becoming more difficult to access and more costly. Increasing strain on infrastructure and natural systems is likely as patterns of economic growth and wealth change. Physical assets and supply chains will be affected by the unpredictable results of a changing climate. And businesses can expect an ever more complex web of sustainability legislation and fiscal instruments. But this, they say, is not the whole story. The central challenge of our age, the central challenge of our age, decoupling human progress from resource use and environmental decline can also be one of the biggest sources of future success for business. More corporations are recognizing that there is value and opportunity in a broader sense of responsibility beyond the next quarter's results that what is good for people and the planet can also be good for the long-term bottom line and shareholder value. Hooray. Not all companies and corporations would agree, sadly, but increasingly many do. The impetus amongst the large retailers here in the UK, for example, to restructure their transport movements, to reduce emissions from their refrigeration units, and to transform the way they deal with waste. <coughs> <coughs> the scramble 
amongst car manufacturers around the world for lower emissions and hybrid varieties and affordable electric vehicles. The way in which large-scale engineering companies are investing hugely in renewable technologies and carbon-reducing equipment. In the US, for example, whilst Congress is totally becalmed on the issue, company after company are simply getting on and doing it. There is some hope yet for the biggest economy in the world. This sea change in the attitudes of major businesses is remarkable and very welcome. In 2010, PricewaterhouseCoopers carried out a survey of senior leaders in major companies across 15 different countries, conducting 700 interviews in total. Their findings showed a substantial degree of consensus across all countries and sectors. A recognition of the challenge posed by climate change, support for a mixture of incentives, carbon taxes, and emissions trading schemes to tackle it, and a desire above all for certainty and consistency in the way governments went about creating the necessary regulatory structures. In the UK, for example, they found amongst the businesses they polled, 64% support for a carbon tax and 68% support for emissions trading schemes. Perhaps most interestingly, 53% globally saw environmental regulation as an opportunity for business. Note regulation and opportunity. This isn't, of course, as counterintuitive as it might appear to those who take a simplistic view that all regulation hinders business opportunity. The reality is that good regulation in the public interest, intelligently administered, creates a level playing field, helps to support the smart and innovative companies, helps to stimulate new ways of doing things, new services and new products, and provides benefits for people, for the environment, and for business. Good environmental regulation has in fact been something of a success story here in the UK during the past 10 years. Sulfur oxide emissions fell by 75% between 2000 and 2010. Nitrogen oxide emissions fell by 37%. Fine particulate PM10 emissions fell by 39%. The amount of waste recovered and reused at all the major industrial plants regulated by the Environment Agency increased from 37% to 67% in 10 years. The number of serious pollution incidents from industry fell from 884 per year to 343 last year. These are significant achievements and they have come because of a firm but proportionate regulatory framework on the one hand and intelligent business response on the other. Of course, we will always have to strive to reduce unnecessarily bureaucratic regulation and to streamline where we can without losing impact. But let no one try and tell us that regulation per se inhibits business growth. Many companies have found that by reducing the amount of waste they generate, the amount of water they consume, and the amount of energy they use, they can find better ways of doing what they do and can save money and cost in the process. Here in the UK, PepsiCo are encouraging the growers they work with to reduce water use by 50% over five years. Marks and Spencer's Plan A called Plan A because there is no Plan B, targeting more sustainable use of energy, recycling of plastics, and lower carbon emissions, generated 70 million pounds of net benefit for the company in 2011. JCB has invested over 300,000 pounds in energy savings since 2007, which has delivered over 4 million pounds in savings to their business in that period. And Kingfisher Group's green products 
now account for 13% of their sales. Being green can indeed be profitable. The two most important influences on corporate environmental practices are creating competitive advantage on the one hand and reducing costs on the other. There are many examples now of companies achieving one or both of these objectives by deciding to do the right green thing. There is economic benefit to be secured by becoming leaner, more efficient, and less wasteful. But there is even more economic opportunity to be seized by looking at the new products, services, and processes that are becoming increasingly needed and demanded around the world as we adjust to the climate and natural resource pressures we all face. 20 years ago, we missed a huge first mover opportunity here in the UK. We had done a lot of early work on the development of wind turbines for energy from wind. But then we allowed the, future de the further development of the technology and manufacture to head off to Denmark, and then subsequently to Germany, China, and the US. We lost out to others, and we've been having to buy heavily from abroad in recent years as a result. Let's not make the same mistake again. Above all, let's not make the same mistake with the development of wave and tidal power. We are an island surrounded by waves and tides. This is the most obvious natural source of energy we can look to for a renewable future. The development of the technology is still at an early stage, but we are, at this moment at least, well ahead of the rest of the world. Of the eight full-scale prototype devices currently installed worldwide, seven are in the UK. There are projects in Orkney, Northern Ireland, and recently announced in Cornwall and Devon. These schemes are being taken forward by innovative companies, in some cases partnered with universities. But there is still too little sense of an overall coordinated program that could drive serious progress. Harnessing wave and tidal power is difficult, of course. Large, bobbing centipedes battling with huge swells and waves off the Orkney coast aren't the easiest bits of machinery to build, to place, and to monitor. And tidal power always needs to be considered with the impact on fish and the ecology of estuaries in mind. But the Carbon Trust believes that practical and economic sources of wave and tidal power could provide 20% of current UK electricity demand. The global market could also be huge, with major potential for UK companies. But we need to get our skates on. In our own small way, the Environment Agency has been helping innovative green product development. The biggest influence on our own carbon footprint as an organization is the pumping we do in order to move water from one place to another, especially in response to threatened flooding. On the River Foss in York last week, for example, we had to pump water into the ooze in order to prevent flooding to several hundred homes. Pumping will always be essential for our work, and we need to find ways of reducing its impact on the environment and on carbon generation in particular. So on the 24th of February this year, we launched a competition together with the government's technology strategy board to design a low or zero carbon pumping solution that we could then apply to all our sites where we have to pump water. Potential competition entrants were invited from the engineering and design industries and from universities. By the closing date of the 9th of April, we had received 13 entries many of them offering exciting ways of achieving our objectives. The hope must be that we will find a technology that works, that saves money and energy, and that can then be sold on around the world too. In the agency, we are consciously trying to develop the greenest ways of procuring goods and services from our supply chain. When we commission flood defenses or use materials in our engineering schemes, 
or purchase vehicles for our operations teams, or find ways of building up river banks to prevent erosion, we are constantly looking for the most sustainable ways of doing things, for the greenest products, for the ways that will keep the carbon footprint of our operation to the minimum. Overall, we spent £659 million as an agency with external suppliers last year. As we continually strive to make that spending more sustainable, I sometimes wonder what the impact would be if the same effort occurred across the whole of the public sector. We should never underestimate the power of the public spending purse, even in these hard times, to change behaviour, to change the kind of products available, and to stimulate innovation. Perhaps the government might consider bringing in a senior business leader who has had real success at greening the procurement profile of his or her company to take a hard look at what happens across the whole public realm. The search for new green solutions and products won't always be easy. There will sometimes be occasions where, in seeking one environmental objective, we risk upsetting another. These cases where we need to disentangle the various environmental gains and threats, where we need to compute a balance of natural cost and benefit rather than assuming a simple all-gain equation, these are the difficult ones. Take onshore wind farms, for example. A great source of renewable energy, yes. But there will be some places, not I hasten to emphasize in a NIMBY context, where they might be a threat to acknowledged landscape value or wildness. And those need to be recognized and decisions adjusted accordingly. Small scale hydropower schemes on rivers are another example. Harnessing the water power of a river to generate electricity, especially if sited at a place where for many years past there has been a substantial weir, can offer major opportunities for local, small-scale, sometimes community-based electricity production. And if an Archimedes screw is used, an appropriate mesh screens put at the bottom, and a fish pass installed, so that the fish, especially trout and salmon migrating upstream, don't get caught in the blades of the turbines, then it is possible to achieve a win-win result that benefits both renewable energy production and fish life in the river. In a number of cases, this has enabled the opening up of stretches of river beyond the hydro site that haven't been accessible for decades, with genuine benefit for migratory fish. This win-win result won't always be the case, however. And there will be times when conserving the ecology of the river will inevitably be more important than securing a small energy gain. Making the right judgment between these two objectives has to be done with care and with proper consideration for both. It's hardly ever easy. If the surge in interest in small-scale hydropower is one example of a bundle of clashing environmental objectives with which we need to tussle, then we face an even bigger challenge in relation to the new energy kid on the block, the development of fracking for shale gas. Shale gas is effectively the gas that is trapped within rock, rather than sitting in a reservoir trapped by rock. And with modern drilling techniques, it has become possible to release the gas by drilling down, in most cases, very deep, thousands of meters down, and then pumping a mixture of water, sand, and chemicals at very high pressure to fracture the rock, releasing the gas and enabling it to flow back up to the surface through the well. It's a technique that has been used for some years now, not entirely without controversy, in the United States. Quadrilla began drilling some exploration boreholes near Blackpool in August of 2010. Fracking was, however, halted after minor earth tremors were experienced in the area in April and May last year. 
An independent expert report recently published by DEC concludes that the tremors were almost certainly caused by the fracking, but that with suitable preventative and monitoring measures in place, there should be no reason why drilling could not recommence. These findings are currently out to consultation. Estimates vary widely as to the quantity of shale gas potential here in the UK. It is likely, however, to be significant, even if it isn't huge. And if the drilling can be found to be cost effective, the development of a new gas resource from within the UK, not dependent on foreign supply and at reasonable cost, would be highly attractive for our, en for our energy needs. Potentially, it ticks the box on energy security, on availability, and on cost. But does it tick the box on environment? The answer is complex, and something like up to a point. Gas is better than coal, both in terms of its immediate impact on the environment and in terms of its greenhouse gas effects. So a major shift from coal to gas as the existing coal-fired power stations start to come to the end of their lives, would reduce levels of pollution and overall climate change impact quite considerably. But this would be another dash for gas, and could land us with an array of gas-fired power stations, all with potential lives way into the future. And the emissions from gas are far greater than those from either renewable sources or nuclear. We could have locked ourselves into a new generation of gas with all the carbon consequences and would then be unable to reduce the carbon impact of our power generation nearly to zero, which has to be the aim if we are to meet our climate change targets. I fear we may be already heading for a new dash for gas anyway, whether or not we end up with major use of shale gas. With renewables still slow to acquire real mass, and with nuclear inevitably taking time to happen, and the need in any case to achieve a steady baseload capacity for electricity production, the attraction of looking to gas as the solution to keeping the lights on will become increasingly strong. This is why and especially if shale gas takes off, it is essential that we look to develop carbon capture and storage for gas and not just for coal. CCS is quite simply a sine qua non. If we are to have a chance of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions around the world, CCS has to be brought into play for both coal and gas. Here in the UK, we are exceptionally well placed to develop the technology, especially with the extensive storage capacity we have under the North Sea. But we need to get a move on. The original competition for CCS projects was launched by the previous government way back in 2007. The current government has now launched a commercialization program for CCS with funding of one billion pounds. We need, though, to press ahead not just in order to help to meet our own emissions targets, but in order to secure some of the early mover advantage there still is to be reaped from this technology. The International Energy Agency believes that CCS will be the key to delivering a fifth of all the greenhouse gas emission reductions we need globally by 2050. Let's be at the forefront of this. Fracking, however, still needs to be done with care. And we need not only to consider the emissions results of a major expansion of gas, but also the immediate environmental issues that arise from the fracking process. The two major concerns will inevitably be, first, the potential for leaks of contaminated water from the shale rock layer itself or from the borehole, and especially 
If this were to get into any of the water aquifers below ground, it could have serious consequences for drinking water supplies. And second, the leaking of methane from the gas recapturing process. In both of these cases, it is imperative that we in the Environment Agency monitor with scrupulous attention and robustness to ensure that everything is literally watertight. We will absolutely do this. My conclusion, therefore, is that with careful use of the drilling technology, with rigorous monitoring and inspection, and with the development of a major program of CCS for gas-fired power generation, then shale gas could be a truly useful part of our energy mix in the years to come. What we mustn't do, however, is to assume that because gas is better than coal, we should simply exploit it and leave it at that. I take the same yes-if approach to the development of a new generation of nuclear power stations. Again, this is a policy area fraught with competing environmental objectives. But again, there are ways to be found through the tangle of challenges and benefits. And there is a green and growth solution to be found. If you'd asked me 20 years ago about nuclear power, I would have taken the traditional green view and said something like over my dead body. I'm happy to admit, however, that I've changed my mind. And it's the prospect of climate change that has changed it for me. Although there is, of course, substantial embedded carbon in the sheer construction of a nuclear power station, the greenhouse gas emissions caused by the generating process itself are close to zero. If we are to achieve the goal we have to of the decarbonization of our production of power as a country, then nuclear quite simply has to be part of the answer. Renewables on their own won't do it. We have to have a combination of renewables, nuclear, carbon capture and storage for fossil fuels, combined heat and power, and of course a major program of energy efficiency work. It's only by doing all of these things, short of the holy grail of nuclear fusion being found, that we'll be able to get anywhere near our necessary goal. But whilst nuclear energy produces little carbon, it does produce extremely toxic waste. And at the moment, we have no long-term storage or handling capacity for that waste. For some time now, the aim has been to create a deep, secure repository underground for long-term storage of the highly radioactive waste from the whole of our nuclear industry. Continuing forever to hold it in rather old tanks at Sellafield or in temporary above-ground facilities isn't on. But at the moment, we don't know where the long-term repository will be or what form it will take, or even how long it's going to be before we have it ready. Some of the current estimates talk of it uh, coming as far into the future as 2040. There are some welcome signs that the government may be recognizing the urgency of this, but they need to do more so, and we need to be much clearer about the practical reality of waste storage before we start laying the foundations for the new power stations that will depend on that storage for the end point of what they produce. Green and growth, then, are both essential elements of our economic and social recovery. We cannot opt for either of them in isolation. But we must also, or we must always remember that the relationship between them can at times be awkward and difficult. Finding more efficient ways of doing things, developing green products and services, using the power of the public procurement, and finding the right answers for energy production, all these are part of the picture. There's one other thing that we need to consider too. Much of what we need to try and do in reducing carbon and waste and water use is about trying to stop climate change happening in the first place. 
But climate change is going to happen to a certain extent, um, even if we're successful in holding the overall impact to only two degrees, the lowest figure that anyone is currently predicting. Most scientists are now telling us it may be considerably more. So we need to prepare to deal with the consequences that will inevitably come from that. In January, DEFRA published the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment, the first time any country has produced such a detailed analysis of the likely consequences of what's happening to our climate. The Environment Agency has a particular role in helping to inform and guide companies, organizations, and authorities in making the best preparation possible. Top of the list are floods and droughts. These will threaten us more frequently, and we need to build in better resilience, whether it's building flood defenses or preparing individual properties for better protection or allowing floodplains higher up a river to be used once again for water storage or advising householders on, to, on how to use less water or ensuring that farmers can store more winter water in order to use in the spring or summer, or encouraging companies to develop innovative solutions that can help people to cope with either too much water or too little. We also need to get more adept at developing our forward plans in a flexible way, a way that allows us to respond to changing circumstances as they develop. We know the direction in which climate change is likely to take us, more extreme weather patterns, more intense change, but we don't know exactly how fast all of this will occur. We don't know precisely when the impacts that are likely to happen will happen. So we need to plan accordingly. Our Thames Estuary 2100 plans are a good case in point. We set out there what we think may well be needed over the next 90 years to protect the outer Thames estuary, including what the future should be for the Thames barrier. But we set these plans out in a series of scenarios and steps so that we can take the appropriate decisions period by period as we see exactly what is happening on the ground and exactly what climate change is doing. We will, I suspect, increasingly need to build this sort of adaptability into our planning and projecting. And many other bodies and businesses are going to need to learn to do likewise. None of this, though, will happen by accident. The degree of greenness in political and public life will, I suspect, constantly ebb and flow depending on other issues and priorities. Some of us will try also constantly to push these issues to the fore. And we're helped by the simple truth I've been trying to explore this evening, that growth can and should be green, and that green can help to stimulate real growth. But none of this will really take hold unless there is a broad public sense that these issues are fundamentally important. As I said at the outset, there's enormous public attachment to the idea of place, to the immediate environment that envelops and sustains our own everyday life. People are passionate about their local stream or park or village green. Harnessing that passion for a bigger picture is an idea of tremendous power, turning the truly local into the global. I sometimes remind my erstwhile political colleagues that organizations like the RSPB and the National Trust have far more members each than all the political parties put together. And what they do is help to take people on a rather remarkable, dare I say, political with a small p, journey. They take a tiny thing, a dipper, say, and they tell you, if you're interested in what's happening to this dipper, you need to understand about the habitat it lives in, which it needs for its survival. You need to understand about water quality and about the fate of our hedgerows and about patterns of agriculture. You need to understand about the planning system and how it protects valuable landscape. 
You need to understand about the pressures of development and urban expansion and industrial growth. You need to understand about how the crucial decisions are taken by business, by local government, by national government, by European institutions. And you need to understand about the impact of climate change that's going to have and what causes it. And you need then to understand about the faltering international discussions and negotiations and how we must press for more and quicker action. And before you know what's happened, you've been taken on a journey of understanding from something incredibly small and tiny and vulnerable, a dipper. And you've reached into a hazy understanding of the global and national political forces that shape the future of our environment and the dipper's environment. These things are all interconnected. If we can help people and policymakers to understand these interconnections and to cherish them, we can make real progress. We can find ways that solve some problems, though probably not all. We can recognize that green growth is not a contradiction, far from it. And we may be able to make a modest contribution to the future of our planet. Thank you.